want to continue where we left off, but this time uh, we talked about the local church, but this time I want to talk about what constitutes or what makes a strong church. What constitutes or makes a strong church? Now remember, it's not, it's not numbers that constitute a healthy, strong church. How many people know that? You can have thousands of people, but nobody loving God, nobody loving each other. It's not a strong church. It's just a, a place where people come, right? And let's look at Matthew. Open Matthew. Jesus stated this in Matthew. And uh, every time I read this, I just uh, get so excited about the plan of Jesus. You know, the plan of Jesus uh, was a powerful plan, but the thing about this is your benefiting from his plan he created the local church we are his body think about it we are his body when you get revelation of that you start realizing my goodness god you really saw something in me forgive allow me to receive your son in my heart and now making me part of his body that's tremendous right and so this is the year of the local church uh, and so we're declaring this is a year. I tell you, this pandemic thought it could kill the church. And it did kill some churches, <laughs> you know. But uh, I thank God that, folks, listen, prophetically, you're going to see the church filled up with people in these last days. Do you agree? Amen. These last days. It's going to be the ark of safety. As the world gets darker, the church becomes that ark of safety that place to go where there's safety. And so I'm believing for that. So all we're doing is equipping ourselves, preparing ourselves, getting ready for what God has for us. But let's see what constitutes a healthy or a strong church. Look at Matthew, the 16th chapter. Again, you should know this by heart, right? But underline it, um, you know, highlight it. Jesus said this. Let me pick up... Um, Jesus said, verse 14, and they said, some say that thou art John, Jesus, the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But notice this, he said to them, now this is where you have to really get revelation of this. He said to them, but whom say ye that I am? Who do you say that I am? Personally, who do you say that I am. And, he, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That word Christ means the anointed one. You are the anointed one, the Son of the living God. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, uh, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So it has to be a revelation, a revealed revelation. Now notice this. Why do we come to church? Well, pastor, I come because I just need to get there. Just need to be there. No, no, really. Why do we come? Well, he said it has to be revealed to us. And this is where Jesus reveals it to us. But verse 18 very clearly says this. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, notice this, this rock is the Gibraltar rock, the foundation, the massive rock. Jesus is the massive rock. Jesus said, upon this massive rock, I will build my church. And here the revelation is, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That word prevail against it shall not stand against it. So in other words, right here, Jesus promises us, makes a declaration that he, that revelation comes to us when we recognize who the church is. Jesus is building his church. The church is the ecclesia. The, the ecclesia in Hebrew means the called out ones. Say with me, I'm a called out one. So in other words, you are called when you receive Jesus. Notice this. Uh, it's impossible to receive Jesus. Now, this is what I'm going to say. You've got to listen clearly because some people can take this out of context. Uh, some people say, well, I received Jesus, but I don't need to be in a local church. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that biblical? It's not. There are a lot of people that say, well, you know what? I believe in Jesus, and they may have. 
but they're not exercising the revelation of who Jesus is because Jesus says, I'm building my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So in other words, we are the body that he's building and the gates of hell will not prevail against the body of Jesus Christ. Now, this is where you have to stand strong against any demonic attack any poverty, any sickness, understand who you are. I am the body of Jesus. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So therefore, I am in the church. I am of the church. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? So in other words, it's upon this statement here, this statement here of, of faith that you made in Jesus that builds his church. Now, it's exciting when you see a lot of believers in the house of God and everybody is, is excited about Jesus, worshiping Jesus. The power of God falls on that place. I'm telling you, the anointing is strong. But as it doesn't take, it doesn't need a church full. It needs people that will just believe. Amen. Come on. And we're a people here that believe. We're a people that believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're a people that believe in Jesus. We believe in the miracles. Hallelujah. So in other words, we're available for the manifestation. Come on, church. We're available for miracles to happen among us. We're available for manifestations of his glory. Hallelujah. Amen. And notice this. If this truth is removed, notice what I'm going to say, the, the foundation crumbles. If it crumbles, it only becomes another institution. And how many churches became institutions? How many churches today, in this century, in this era, that are preaching nothing but, now notice what I'm going to say, motivational. Motivational is good for, for a moment, but motivation is not going to give you strength. Motivation is going to encourage you, but you need spiritual strength, which is the Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And I love it when people, when preachers preach the Word of God. I love it when they talk the Word. I need something that will challenge me. When I go to the house of God, I want something that will just challenge me, to build me up, to make me stronger, to tell me where I'm off, tell me where I'm going, tell me if I'm going in the right direction. I want a church. I want the Word of God to just... You know, you got to understand this. The Word of God is needed in these days. Come on, church. How many of you like Shipley's Donuts? <laughs> Amen. If you ever, I'm from Texas, and down, down the road where I, was, where I was raised was the, the hometown of Shipley's Donuts, right? The home place. And so Shipley's Donuts is great. But I'm going to tell you something. You can't live on Shipley Donuts every day of your life. When Shipley's moved out here, everybody was bombarded. You, Pastor Christine, and I stood in line. We got, a, we got a dozen donuts and some, right? But I'll tell you what, the very next day, the next week, we quit going there because we already had our fill of donut, right? You see what I'm saying? This is the way the church is. The church, the church has its fill already of sugar, sugar, sugar. Now it needs the word, 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 word. How many of you can say amen to that? I need the word, hallelujah, amen. When I turn on the television and I put on a preacher, I want to hear the word. I don't want to hear what you think and what I think and this is what I assume and this is what, what I read in Oprah's magazine. No, no, no. I want to know what the Bible says. Come on, church. Can you say amen? Hallelujah, amen. Go with me to the book of Acts now. This is where the church began. In fact, the word of Acts is actually... The, the acts of the disciples, this is where the church first was literally opened and created. Amen. And we find something that the church grew. Thank God for the church growing. In fact, uh, 5,000 at one time were added to the church simply by Peter preaching the gospel of Jesus. Later on, we find out another 3,000 were added. By the time you knew, the church was exploding. Thank God for the book of Acts. Thank God for the church in Acts. Now go to Acts 2, verse 44. Notice what it says here. And all that believed were together. In other words, verse 42 says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking in bread and in prayer. So this tells us what the church was doing. The church was, uh, was teaching the word. They were having fellowship. They were breaking bread, eating together. And they had prayer together. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Now notice this. The Bible says in verse 44, And all that believed were together and had all things in common. Now let's just see this for a moment. Had all things in common. Stop there for a moment. 
All that believed were together. Right there tells you something. Togetherness. This tells me there was a unity, a unified effort. Now notice this. Look at the 21st century church. Should there be a unified effort in the church? Do you see it? No, you don't. You don't see a unified effort. Everybody is out for themselves. Well, I feel like going to church today. Well, maybe I'll go next Sunday. Well, maybe I'll do this. Oh, oh you know, I, well, let's, don't, let's, let's just do this before we go to church. You see what I'm saying? What's going on? Other things have come into people's lives to distract them from the unified effort of the local church. Now, now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to try to understand that or try to figure this out. Really, if you and I were the devil, <laughs> come on church, which there are people that are really are, act like the devil. But let's just, let's, just, let's, just, let's just talk about this. If you and I were the devil, where would your attack be? Would your attack be on the movie house? Would your attack be on a nightclub? Would your attack be uh, 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 in the local zoo? Would your attack be uh, in the grocery store? Or would your attack be among those that are going to church? Come on, church, let's, let's get real now. So in other words, the enemy doesn't like the church, uh, the, the body, Jesus. The enemy does not like you going to church. That's why you've got to make a conscience effort, a one-time declaration that as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I don't care if it hair lips the governor, governor. I'm going to the house of God. And let me tell you, that, uh, that's being serious. The people in California, uh, when, when the governor of California said, no, no, no more church, no more singing. No, you can't. No, no. People said, no, 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 no. We're going to the house of the Lord. They arrested a pastor in California. They arrested a pastor in Canada. Uh, for having church service. What's going on? The devil is trying to shut down what Jesus is building. Jesus is building a church. Can you say amen? Come on. I'm not hearing any amens. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And the devil hates that. So he's going to do everything he can to keep the people from having a unified effort. Unified effort. Unified effort. But if I can tell you in the book of Acts, there was a unified effort. People were coming. People were being baptized. People were joining the church. The church was growing. They didn't even have a building. They were meeting outdoors. 5,000 in one service were being saved, worshiping Jesus. Oh, there was a movement. And, and folks, let me tell you something. Uh, that movement has not stopped. Now, there's some ge uh, geographical areas or locations where this movement is still going. Revival is taking place. Awake well, we're in the awakening. Let's, let's face it. We're in the awakening. Hallelujah. Amen. So in other words, we got to believe that Jesus is building this church. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you say amen? So look at verse 44 again. And all believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 44, 45, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all as every man had need. So in other words, listen, they were saying, do you, do you need a refrigerator? I got a refrigerator. Do you need, you know, I'm just saying, do you need some shoes, some extra sandals? I have some. Do you need a cloak? I got it. Do you need some hay for your mules? Or I have it. Do you, uh, listen, I've got so much produce I can bring. What's going on? A unified effort in the house of God. In the house of God. In the house of God. Amen. And that's a healthy, strong church when there's a unified effort. Hallelujah. Now, you know what I saw here? Strategically, they were organized to reach their, their goals. Strategically, they were organized to reach their goals. The work of the church doesn't happen. I notice what it's, notice this. The, the work of the church doesn't happen accidentally or in a, look, notice this, in, a, in a, a system that is broken. It doesn't happen that way. I love when, when, when I got saved, I went to three pastors I served under. My father, number one, was a pastor. Second was John Osteen, the father of Joel Osteen, and then Pastor Steve Teal. Now, DiMalo and Christine got to meet my pastor through video, right? Uh, D found a video of me being licensed. I was a young little kid, probably, what, 30, 30 years old? 
they found that video. And anyway, the thing that I want to say, these three pastors, I learned so much. And every church or every, those three pastors that had, the, that had those powerful churches, it was such an organized church, such an organized effect, such a move of God. It was not chaotic. It was organized. Now, I've been in some chaotic churches where, where people are coming in when they want to. Uh, I remember going to preach to a church, and it was already 10 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning, and pastor uh, said, we're just going to wait for more people to come. And I'm thinking, 10 o'clock, it's already 1030, still waiting on people. You know what this pastor did? He waited for the people to come to start the service. So can I ask you a question? Who was literally leading that church in time? The people. People were coming in at 1045, you know, and, and so the pastor waited. Uh, you know, Lester Sermon, a powerful preacher, they did that to him, and I should have did it, but I was too embarrassed. When they gave him the pulpit, he got up there and says, hello, everybody, it's time for me to go home. You guys don't want to hear the word. I'm going home. Walked off stage. Now, why did he do that? Because the people had no interest in being there on time to go through the worship, to go through the offering, and be ready for the word of God. They didn't care. It was chaotic. Pastors allow that. How many people know what I'm talking about? It's, things can get chaotic in churches, you know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, I remember one time uh, we were having church in, in Lakewood Church and a woman stood up to give a word of the Lord and Pastor Osteen told her, ma'am, not right now, I'm preaching, wait till I'm, I'll indicate when to release that word. Now notice this, the word of God says even prophecy is subject to the prophets. She didn't want to sit down. She just says, I have a word. All he did was, ushers, remove that woman. <laughs> I'll never forget this. They didn't want, she didn't want to go. She was putting a fight. You know what they did? Literally, they picked her up by her ankles, by her seat, by her shoulders, and they carried her, they carried her out as a dead woman. She was just stiff as can be. They just carried her out. And, and this happened, like for me to pass Christine, so I'm a young preacher, and I'm looking, I said, whoa, the boldness of my pastor. Hey, she just... She, they took her to the back and prayed for her and pulled out a demon from her. She was demon-possessed. You see, now notice this. What if pastor would say, well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It would have been chaotic. I was at the Southwest Believers Convention sitting in second row, and, and, and Kenneth Copeland, my, my spiritual father, is teaching the Word of God, and a woman yells, you're, uh, she said, you're in error. And she got up and came to the front, and, and, and I'm there, I'm watching, and I want to see how my spiritual father is going to handle it. The ushers came immediately. He said, hold on. He went to this woman. He got in front of her in his beautiful eyes. He said, do you know Jesus loves you? And he put his finger and says, do you know I love you? Jesus love you. Now, in the name of Jesus, go sit down. She just got up and sat down. Now, what was that about? Love. Chaotic was, uh, that type of chaotic service was gone, right? See, this is what the devil tries to do in local churches, tries to make it chaotic, tries to turn it around, tries to turn it where there's, listen folks, if there's a chaotic service, there's not an anointing in it. It's all structure. Uh, you know, uh, your pastor is trying to fix it, trying to organize it, trying to work it. It's not going to happen. But I thank God. What I see here, this was strategically. See, a church requires planning. A church requires order. A church requires effectiveness of God. I love it when, when, when we pray. We pray at every service. We pray every service. We pray at home. We pray, um, you know, even the last uh, month, the last service Sunday of the month, we pray, we pray because we need God. Before I come up here, no sooner when I come up here, right, I know when I'm getting ready to come, I say, Father, I need you. I cannot do it on my own. I need you. And I say, Holy Spirit, please, I need you. I receive you right now. I come up here, I come up here all the time with fear and trembling. Why? Because I need God every time. Hallelujah. Amen. I know I need God. Now look, look at Romans, the 12th chapter. Now, the church requires planning, effective uh, order to accomplish God's will. Can you say amen? 
Uh, and, and, and it's so important. Now, I know uh, certain countries and uh, certain things, you can't have certain things, but, but even them, it has to be in, in an orderly fashion. I remember one time uh, there was a young man, uh, well, I say young, at that time he was young, and, and he was going to preach at a dog, <laughs> a junkyard dog followed him in church. Beautiful. I mean, I was, I was a young man, and he's getting ready to preach this in Latin America, and he gets up there, Walter, Walter gets up here, and all of a sudden this dog is following Walter. Well, Walter, when he's praying, he's praying, and he met a dog, so he's petting a dog, and he fed a dog a sandwich, and well, the dog fell in love with him, followed him in the church, amen, and the dog got on the stage, and the pastor said, oh, leave, leave him, leave him, leave him, leave him, and I thought that was so cute, but at the same time, no, come on now, <laughs> come on, let's get this dog, get him out of the church. People are saying, oh, beautiful dog in the church, you know, Come on, church. You see what I'm saying? The devil can use these things to distract people. How many people have ever been distracted in church? And you know that you missed something so important. Wow, I missed it. What do you say? I got distracted because of that. I got, uh, oh, whoa, 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 what happened? What happened? Now, understand something. That distraction could be a distraction for you to miss what that word was for you at that moment. Right? Come on, church. So these are the things that we have to understand. So this makes a healthy church, a strong church. Hallelujah. Amen. Now look at Romans, the 12th chapter. These are just the basics of understanding the church. But see, we have to. If this prophetic word is, this is the year of the local church, doesn't it stand for reason that we have to study the local church? Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus has told uh, us through the prophet that this is the year of the local church. I'm going to take it serious. I'm going to say this is the year of the local church. That means Jesus wants to teach us something. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He's building his church. Romans, the 12th chapter. Now notice this. A strong church is filled with people that know Jesus is building his church. Now, I want you to underline seven gifts that you're going to see in the church. And I want to call them motivational gifts. So if you have a Bible, I want you to write down over that chapter motivational gifts. And then I want to tell you what to underline. Now notice what it says. Pick it up in verse 14. Are you there, ladies and gentlemen? Romans 12, 14. Now, now notice this. This is for you and me. For as we have many members in one body, being all of us are members in one body of Jesus. All members have not the same office. Now we're going somewhere. You're a member. You have a place in the church. And the Bible calls it a position, an office. Say with me, I have an office. Come on, church. You do have an office. Amen. Hallelujah. Notice what it says here. So we being ma uh, many are one body in Christ. Verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ, the anointing. And everyone's, everyone members one of another. Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Underlying prophecy, number one, that's the number one gift in the house of God. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth, on teaching. So you see, underline ministry and underline teaching. Verse 8, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do with simplicity. Underline those two. Exhort it, exhort it, or giveth. Uh, and he that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. That word ruleth mean organizer. Ruleth mean a person with the gift of organization. Now notice this. Here are seven, I want to call them motivational gifts because these are gifts that should motivate you in trying to say, Lord, one of these you've called me to do. How will I know God? Now look at me, everybody. You just don't do any, meeny, miny, mo to find out which one you want. You allow the Holy Spirit in his process of time to start uh, growing you, developing you, and it's also a confirmation by the Spirit of God towards your pastor. Do you know your pastor? Now, now I want to tell you something. When your pastor looks at you, when I look at you, uh, I, I, you, you, people get a little nervous. He's reading me. It's not that. It's probably God showing me something at that moment about something that I never saw about you. 
And it's not something that you did at home. Something that, you, see, see, notice this, notice this. The word of God itself will deal with whatever you go through. Can you say amen? amen. I love the word. I can say something about the word and one of you will say, wow, that was for me. And then somebody else will say, wow, that was for me. And they both different, different things are going through. That's the way the word works. In other words, the word of God is like a, it's like a, it's like a merry-go-round. The word is presented and God shows all of you wherever part of the merry-go-round you are. In other words, you may be standing on one side of the merry-go-round and you're seeing a certain way. Somebody's sitting over here. You're seeing the word of God. This is what your pastor does. When he presents the word, then the Holy Spirit almost, it's almost like I see, don't see you, but I see something in you. It's hard to explain, but I want you to understand this. So in other words, we have to see that this is the way God works in our walk. Now notice this. These gifts do not happen overnight. They happen, now notice what I'm going to say. They happen the more that you're available in the house of God, the more that you get revelation of the word, the more that you're there. Uh, some people don't go to church often, but they want to do something in the church, but it's not going to work that way because they're not giving time for them to, to grow into the move of the church. Can you say amen? I remember years ago, a couple left the church and said, Pastor, uh, you, don't, you, you don't use us. We're singers, but you don't use us and we can sing. And I remember telling them, well, uh, I, I'm glad you could sing, but, but give yourself some time in the church. Give yourself at least four to five months to sit under the word and, and let's just uh, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. He said, okay, we'll do that. It was three months and they were gone. Right? So your pastor calls him and says, well, we, we believe that we're going to another church. We just, we just want to go to another church. You see what I'm saying? So, so in other words, if your pastor jumps on something that, is, it, 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 that he thinks will be a benefit to the church, it can be a danger to the church. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? It, it's like, it's like uh, if you never preached before, let's say, uh, let's say Sophia's never preached before. It, 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 and I say, Sophia, I want you to come up here and give the, give the Sunday morning sermon. Well, she's not going to come Sunday morning. <laughs> she's going to be at home, man. She's not going to come, right? Or she may be bold enough to come up here and say, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, whatever it may be. No, that would be ridiculous for your pastor to do that. But what constitutes a pastor to tell Sophia to come? I'm seeing something in her. I'm seeing dedication. I'm seeing her love for the Lord. I'm seeing her gifting. I'm seeing an encouragement. She's encouraging the body as she talks to them. I hear her talk to people. Oh, my goodness. She can sure encourage. And the Holy Spirit now starts to confirm some things and starts uh, showing you things. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, Pastor, I need you to use Sophia as such and such. Get her prepared for this. Yes, sir. That's what constitutes a healthy church. Come on, church. You see what I'm saying? Look at these giftings again. There's seven of them. Now, we don't have time now to discuss these seven, but I promise you, I promise you these seven, we, you know, we can learn them. Uh, and you can learn what each one means so that you can have an idea what each one means. I'll give you a quick example, quick example, quick example, a quick testimony. We had a feeding center at our local church. I was in charge. I was the, the, the associate pastor for this feeding program, and we had a lot of volunteers. We had a lot of food. We had thousands of dollars of food, and we were, we were busting in people that needed food. And, and I remember that uh, the food was coming in, but it was going fast, and we were not getting food fast in. We had people going to the grocery stores getting bread, getting uh, dented cans, and we were having donations, and we were having people buy. Pastor Christine was even buying food from certain warehouses, and, and food was going fast. Food was going fast. And I remember my reports, my reports were, you know, the food is going faster. What's going on? Uh, and so finally I went to the, to the main place where the food's at, and I was just walking and praying and looking at the people, and all of a sudden I started realizing that bunch over there is giving more food to people than it should be. I mean, it's only one bag per couple. And if it's a family, then we can go to four bags. But, and then, of course, we have everything organized. And, and I'm noticing that this one guy was carrying almost three bags. Hi, Pastor. 
And I say, hey, stop. Hey, all right. Is that all you for yours? He said, that's right. They just blessed me all this food. And I found out the problem. The person that was given the food, bless her heart, she was just a giver. She just wanted to give and give and give. She had no knowledge of how to organize it, no knowledge of how, to, how the food lasts. So finally, I said, Lord, you got to help me, Lord. How do I handle this? I, I don't want to pull her from that, but she loves that job. And the Lord showed me this scripture. Now look at it. Look at it again. He says this, having then gives different according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. According to your proportion of faith. I saw that. According to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on minister, or he that teacheth on teacheth, or he that exhorteth, or he that giveth, or he that, uh, that ruleth. Oh my goodness, I don't have somebody back there that can organize that particular group. So I had to find an organizer. And I found someone, somebody that likes numbers, somebody that likes accounting, somebody that likes just, I mean, one, two, three, and four, right? What did I do? I put that person together with this group, and that department became so orderly, right? Now notice, it's in the church. We had an usher, and he sat in the back, and, and everybody said, you know, Pastor, have you noticed so-and-so is not paying attention? He's an usher. And I said, no, I never noticed that. So one service, I'm watching this usher, and he's looking up. Uh, we had a light bulb out. Oh, there it is right there. See that light bulb, everybody? See, look up, everybody. There's a light bulb out. Right? I didn't know that light bulb was out. Who found, who found that light bulb out? Christiana, right? What made you look up? Huh? Mary Page. Okay, now what I'm going to say. Our usher was looking at flickering lights. They were, they were uh, fluorescent lights, and he was looking at a flickering light, and it just bothered him. And then one Saturday, he came with this tall ladder and changed all the light bulbs. Now, I found out something. That was his gifting. His gifting was just to take care of the church. Now, he was hearing, but his gifting, that person became in charge of, what was it, janitorial maintenance. Kept the church Filters changed, light bulbs changed. I mean, everything was right because he was in charge of that. Those are the giftings that are in the church. Those are the giftings in the church. There's people in here that God can use you to exhort. God can use you to, to be a, 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 an organizer, uh, someone to teach. Oh gosh, someone to teach uh, the word of God. Someone uh, to, to be able to to be able to be a giver, one that just wants to give, give, one that wants to be part of helping the poor, give, give, give clothes. You know, we had clothes ministry. You remember that clothes ministry? People were bringing in clothes and we said, oh, oh, wait, wait, no more dirty clothes. Wash them, bring them in washed. And the shoes that you bring in, make sure those shoes are good enough for you to use. Don't bring in these holy shoes. So we had some great, I mean, we had some nice clothes and we went to the cleaners, picked up a lot of clothes from the cleaners that, they, that people that never picked up. And so we had some really good clothes. So that's in the church already. Can you say amen? Now, look at something. A strong church here, according to this word of God, is filled with people. People who serve through their strengths and their gifts and their spiritual gifts. Come on, church. Everyone right now has a strength. Everyone right now has a gifting. Everyone right now in this house has a spiritual gifting that is going to be revealed, but you've got to understand, God is the one that reveals it. But you have to be who you are in Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Be who you are in Jesus. When you gave your life to Jesus, say, Jesus, use me as you want to. Use me. And then just get involved, whatever God wants you to do. I'm telling you, uh, we're going to get busy here. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Amen. This church is going to explode. Or I'm going to tell you something. We're going to have to be immediately mobilized to lose your seats. Come on, church. You're going to have to be mobilized to immediately get involved in, in the altars and get involved in prayer, get involved in, in teaching, get involved in, in just helping. Come on. There's so much has to be done. Hallelujah. Amen. Now go with me to the book of Acts. Hallelujah. Amen. So we have to discover our spiritual gifts. Go, go to the book of Acts. Go to the book of Acts, the second chapter. We have to Discover our spiritual giftings and begin using them to accomplish what the Lord created us to do. 
when, as you're going there, when, when we all operate in these areas, in our giftings, the church becomes strong. And, and not only does it become strong, it becomes so helpful and, and it becomes so useful to the things of God. Now, let me, let me, let me give you an example. We were at a funeral years ago, great pastor, beautiful church, but uh, my, well, we knew people that were going there, and uh, pastor was involved in so much, so much, so much. He was going from every corner. Well, he died of a heart attack. And uh, I remember going to that funeral and, and, and being there, and, and we were just paying our respects, and and uh, at the dinner, we're all talking, and everybody's talking, and, and they realize we, we, we overworked our pastor. I wasn't a member there, but my, my friend was, a relative that we, was going there, and, and she confirmed that, yeah. He was going all hours. He was making visit calls. He was making prison calls. He was doing this and doing that. He was cutting the grass, doing the church, painting the church, cleaning the windows, uh, feeding the poor. Just, he was even taking people to the grocery stores, and, and I, I made a declaration. I said, Father, you didn't kill him. You didn't take him. The enemy found a way to overwork him, and the overworking brought a death. He was a young man, probably, what, 45 years old, Pastor Christine? So, so I realized something. This is a pastor that did not have any help. Or he didn't know how to help, have people help him. And so I made a declaration, Lord, I will learn from that and I will teach other pastors and we will learn. And so the Lord took us to a time that we were teaching pastors. Even in Mexico City, we we're teaching a lot of pastors to this day, a lot of pastors. We were teaching pastors here in Oklahoma City, uh, many churches. There was a time that the Lord had us involved over 3,000 churches across the United States teaching pastors. And one of the things that we were teaching pastors is you have to let these giftings operate in the church. You're not a one-man show. You, ha you have to allow others to help you. But the only way you have to do it properly according to the Word of God. Because, see, if you don't know the Word of God, then you don't know how to work it. It's like one day you can have a praise and worship leader singing, and the next day they're gone. And like you're saying, well, why did that person leave? Well, it was probably too early for that person to take a place. How many people know that? Uh, people that are in front of other people, they've got to be humble. Because if they're prideful in stage, then that's all it is. They're, they want to show. And the devil will knock you down. See, Satan himself was a worshiper. Satan lost his, his ability to be an angel over God. In fact, uh, it was amazing the work that Satan Lucifer did in heaven. But he was out of heaven quick when, when he rebelled against God. Now, go with me to Acts, the second chapter. Are you guys getting something? Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Go with me to Acts, the second chapter, verses 7. So the Bible says in, in verses 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how he, hear we every man in our own tongue where we were born, uh, Parthians, Medians, and Elamites, and dweller, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Potus, and Asia, and Persia, and Pompila, and Egypt, and, and in the parts of Libya, and Crane, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. And it goes on, goes on, goes on. Verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Now, let me just give you a quick history. These all joined the church. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this tells me it's not about a white church. It's not about a black church. It's not about a Hispanic church. It's not about a Filipino church. Now, I understand culture. And I understand language barriers. But this is, this, is, this is a New Testament church where you're going to get people of, of all nationalities. Come on. Uh, we're colorblind in the sense People say, when people meet me, they'll say, oh, so uh, how's your Spanish church doing? I say, Spanish church? I don't even talk Spanish. 
And they say, oh, well, 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 you're Hispanic, aren't you? And then I'll joke with them, no, I'm Filipino. <laughs> They'll say, oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm not Filipino. I'll give you a story about that a little bit. But anyway, people assume, well, you know, DiMalo one day was preaching up here, and, and people watched it online, and thank God for DiMalo. People actually thought this was a black church. <laughs> Amen. We don't see color. I don't think we're we're all one in Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. We're all one in Jesus. That's a healthy church. That's a healthy church. Come on, church. Where we're colorblind. We don't care who walks in the door. Hallelujah. Amen. We're colorblind. What I mean, you know, we don't see race. That's a beautiful church. But when you start singling out race, you start moving away. It, It now becomes racist. Oh, I, I've been in those churches. Oh, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there. I remember I took a tour into South Carolina, and they wanted to, uh, they, they, they liked the way I preached, and I was a Hispanic pastor, and, and what this bishop was trying to do was trying to shake their, <laughs> their, their churches to receive a Hispanic preacher, right? I'm telling you, <laughs> I should have did it, but I got up there trying to speak Spanish. I said, buenos dias, amigos, and they said... <laughs> I was picking on them, right? I said, oh, no, I, I came to preach, amen. You know, it broke, it broke their chains of racism. They enjoyed it. And so what they started doing is inviting, uh, you know, their churches are beautiful. They invited a, a Hispanic pastor to take over a Hispanic community. So now they're having Hispanic people in the church, Filipinos, Native Americans, you name it so much, right? Why? That's a healthy church. That's a healthy church. Come on, church. You may be sitting next to one that was a prostitute and got, gave their life to Jesus last night. Say with me, that's all right. Come on. You may be sitting one that's a, that's a drug leader who comes into Jesus and gives his life to Jesus then throws his, his, his drugs on the, on the platform. Amen. I've seen that happen. Come on, church. Pastor Christina, she, take, she gave a testimony of Sunday about the inner city. Uh, they thought we were a cop. They, they thought I was a cop because I drove a... Ford LTD looked like an unmarked car. So whenever I'd go into this area just to pray, they, they would run. They thought I was a cop. And then I got, I got the reputation, Mr. Preacher. They thought it, the church was a front. They thought I was undercover. Of course, Pastor Christine said, I look like a cop all the time when I have my glasses and, you know, tough as can be. Well, you know, when you're in the inner city, you're tough. You're, you have to be tough. I remember one day I was picking up some wood at a, down the road from our church in the inner city. Let me just tell you something. The inner city, our church was next door to a Bales Bond. Right? And our church was one block down from the city jail and the city police department. The, 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 all the police, the sheriff departments, all the detectives were all there. The street, Houston Avenue, was known for Cop Alley. I mean, they were doing busts. I mean, literally... What's that, what's that show that came that they reported there? What's that show? Um, what you going to do when the cops come in? Cops. That's it. Cops, what you going to do when the bad boys come? You know, they recorded it down the corner from our church. <laughs> That's how serious it was. So I go to the, laundry, the, the lumber yard, and I, and I have my car, and I, I go buy lumber. And uh, two guys are walking down the street. I say, hey, guys, preacher man, what's up? I said, I need you to carry these boards for me. Oh, yes, sir, preacher. Yes, sir, preacher. I didn't realize I had two gangbangers carrying wood to the church. <laughs> they're carrying wood, and their pants are falling down. They're holding their pants. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, it was one of those type of, but you know what? God had us there. We had mercy and grace. But, you know, people would come in and get saved. You know, just people from all different, I mean, all different backgrounds. If I can tell you what I saw in this city, behind my church, we saw syringes where heroin addicts were back there. You see, so, so people are getting saved. So what happens? We don't, see, we don't see any difference. When they come to Jesus, man, it's like a fish when you get out of the lake. you got to clean it. Jesus is going to clean it. Come on, church. Amen. So notice this. Let's look at Acts, the second chapter, verse 7. And they were amazed. Yeah. They were amazed. Unity was in the church. The church is composed of people of various races, languages, backgrounds, cultures. Why? Because we're the body of Christ. And that's what's going to happen, church. That's what's going to happen. Go with me to Matthew very quickly. Hallelujah. Amen. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Say me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So what, what are we doing? We're learning about the local church. 
and you're needed. You have a gifting in the church. Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 24. Notice what it says. Jesus said unto his disciples. Now notice what he said. Unto his disciples. That word disciples literally means disciplined ones. A disciple is a discipline. When you and I come to church, now Jesus starts disciplining us. He starts changing us. And he says, he says to them, notice what Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and who will ever lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man's profit? Or what, for what is a man's profit if he shall gain the world and lose his own soul? Question mark. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, what does this mean to me in the church? Genuine love. That's what it tells me. Jesus says, you're going to follow me. You're my disciple. Then you're going to have to deny yourself. Denying oneself is one of the things that we have to work on. Church, listen. Denying yourself means I'm going to deny who I am for the sake of Christ. And this is where it's powerful. Love is the glue, church. Love is the glue which holds the church together. There was a church in Arizona, the pastor, uh, a lot of wealthy people there. It was a white, affluent church, beautiful church. Um, I got to meet him. In fact, I picked him up from the airport. Um, and uh, Tommy Barnett. How many people have ever heard of Tommy Barnett? I, you, pastor uh, Christine and I actually picked him from the airport. We got lost in San Diego. <laughs> Tommy Barnett. At that time, we didn't have apps. But we had maps, paper maps, and he sat in the back. I said, Pastor Barnett, uh, can you tell me where I'm at? I gave him the map. <laughs> and he said, turn right, turn left. A man with thousands of people. One day he told his church, church, we're changing something here today. Next Sunday we're going to invite people from the streets. We're sending two Greyhound buses to the inner city of Phoenix. And we're going to pick up, pick up people that are hurting. So be ready. The church was always packed. That Sunday morning, half of them came. Amen? But they had a powerful service. People from all... Listen, they brought in alcoholics, drug addicts, prostitutes. Uh, they brought all kinds of people in from the inner city. But not only the inner city, a lot, of, a lot of people that are just hurting. And a lot of them got saved. From that moment on, Tommy Barnett, Pastor Tommy Barnett, found out what his church is about. That's why his son right now bought this hospital. What's the name of the hospital in Los Angeles? It's the one General Hospital. Remember General Hospital? Huh? General Hospital. He bought, he bought that hospital, turned it into a, a, a center for homeless people, drug addicts. Uh, uh, you know, he bought the evangel evangelist, evangelistic center. Uh, tem uh, excuse me? Dream Center. That's it right there. He, he, the Dream Center was formed because of Tommy Barnett's father's desire. Amen. Dream setters are all over now. But notice this. That's a healthy church. The church before Tommy Barnett had, that was not a healthy because all the people left. Because they didn't want to sit next to somebody that was a from a street. See, this is where Matthew 16, Jesus said, deny, deny yourself. And that's where true love is. That's where genuine love. However, this kind of love, now notice what I'm going to say. This kind of love, church, is not born out of mutual interest, but it originates from God. It's not out of your interest, but out of God. Come on, church. If we'll pray, now notice what I'm going to say. I want you to listen to what I'm going to say. If we will pray effective for people, it doesn't matter who. If we will pray that God will deliver them, God will bring them. Amen? But if we pray only for what we want, it's not going to happen. Amen? Now, now notice this. When... when President Obama became president. I, I, I didn't agree. I didn't vote for him. I didn't agree with him. Um, I just didn't care. I said, no. The Lord said, you pray for him. He's your president. So I noticed that when I started praying for President Obama, first of all, because he's president, I started feeling for him. I started feeling the pressure that he has. Now notice this, the errors that he does, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about as a person. And I realized that when you pray for people, you change her attitude. We got to pray for Nancy Pelosi. 
<laughs> we got to pray for Biden. We got to pray for Kamala. We got to pray. Simply because you didn't vote for them, or maybe you did it, I don't know. It doesn't mean that you continue that way. You now pray for them. Pray for those that are hurting. Now, a lot of these senators, they're, they're really torn. Their minds are torn. Pray for them, right? Uh, this is Ramadan week. Uh, pray for the Muslims that are going to church. How do we pray for them, Pastor? Pray that they see Jesus. Many Muslims have come to the Lord because they've seen Jesus through their Ramadan time. Pray. Uh, I was invited to a Muslim's home. In fact, let me give you a little story real quick. This church, when it burnt, this church was burnt at one time. A Muslim man bought it. A Muslim man that is the administrator for that mosque there bought this church. And they were going to turn it into a training center for Muslims. But he felt, no, we got to fix that church and keep it a Christian church. A Muslim man told me that. Well, when I met him, in fact, we didn't buy it from him. We bought it from a pastor that bought it from him. But I met him. He invited us to his house. It was Ramadan week. They fast. You know what? We went to his house. His wife said, we want you to eat. We prepared some meals for you. And I'm thinking, it's Ramadan. They're fasting. See, see what fasting does? So we sat. I said, no, 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 ma'am. Really, we just had a big Whataburger. <laughs> I enjoy Whataburgers. And I said, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. We just had a hamburger. We're fine. We're fine. Well, do you have, want some tea? You want to, I'll take some water. So he brought me water. That man said this. Now, listen to what he say. He said, you know, you're Muslim. I'm Muslim and you're Christian. He says, we tithe only from our investments, but you tithe. You believe in tithing of your income. He said, that's good. If you ever need me to help you organize fundraising for your church, let me know. I raise millions of dollars for our church here. So, uh, you know, I believe, uh, you know, I respect you as a Christian man, just like you respect me as a Muslim. And I thought, wow, God, I'm praying for him. I'm praying for him. And I've been praying every time I pass by. Every time we drive down this road, what do we do? We pray for our, our Muslim people or their friends over there. We pray for this whole area, that Jesus will cover it. Hallelujah, amen. And so the more that we have love toward people as a whole, then God starts working on our behalf. If we're Now, not that you're racist, but if people are racist, then you're not going to have any interest in helping people of different nationalities. Now, I'll, keep, I'll give you a story before we go. You ready to go? All righty. I, I was in San Jose, California, invited to preach at a Filipino's church, right? Good friend of mine. And so he, they picked me up from the hotel. We went, and we're driving up the church, and I saw a big old, their billboard says, uh, I don't even remember the name of the church. The, so-and-so, Life Center welcomes Pastor... Robert Gonzalez. And they had it the whole week. <laughs> and that morning, I'm sitting in front row, and the church is packed. I want to say maybe 2,000 people. And I'm standing there, sitting there, and I'm worshiping. And I told the pastor, I said, Pastor, it's a pretty full house. He looked, leaned over, and he says, I don't know three quarters of them. And I said, what? So I got up to preach, and we had a great time. It was the only Father's Day that I missed. The only Father's Day that I missed for my home. It was on a Father's Day. Packed out house. Well, it turned out to be that they came. People thought I was a, a, radio, a, a television newscaster from the Philippines. A famous newscaster from the Philippines. They wanted to come see. And they said, I look just like him. <laughs> and so that's why I tell you that joke. Amen. And so, yeah, his name is Robert Gonzalez, too. He's, he's a Filipino. Amen. So, so we had lunch, and boy, we had a party. They had a party. They, they brought out all kinds of native food. I cried when I got back to the hotel because I've never experienced the Filipino um, culture. Never experienced it. I cried. They, they just loved God. They loved Jesus. And when they found out he's Hispanic, they would just try to teach me how to eat all kinds of food, right? And so, but I learned something. I said, they love Jesus. Let's stand up, church. 
We love Jesus. We love the Lord. Now notice this. Let me encourage you. It's not about numbers, church. It's about the love of Jesus for each other. God will bring those that we pray for. God will bring those. In fact, I have prayed for many of you, all of you really. Amen? And the prayer that we say, Father, bring those that are hungry for your word. Bring those that are hurting that need you, Jesus. That just need the word, are hungry for the word. Because see, when I moved to Oklahoma City, and I, this is where I wanted, I wanted to be frank with you, I couldn't find a church that could teach me the word. I found too much, too much, uh, uh, what do you call it? I don't know what you want to say it. Amen. But I wanted to know the word. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. Father, tonight we see in Scripture, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, what you intended for your church to be. Please forgive us, Lord, if we moved away from that. I speak to, I, I represent, as a pastor, I represent many pastors uh, spiritually, Lord, or, you know, in my prayer. Please forgive us if we've left to the right or to the left simply by trying to do things to grow the church. We know what grows the church, Lord. It's you. It's your word. You said upon this rock you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, Father, we thank you. And, Lord, give us wisdom. Give us direction. And, Father, thank you for the motivational gifts that we see in Romans. And, Father, we are a church full of gifts. We're a church ready. We're a church ready to acknowledge our giftings. And, Lord, we're patient in your presence as you would have us to be released to do what you called us to do. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen. Hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Give the Lord a praise. Come on. Hallelujah, 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 amen.